John Reynolds. Um, I'm from Augusta, Maine. Hi, welcome to another episode of Recover Loud. I'm your host, Mike Paddleford, and I recover loud. This show first started with the hopes that we could help end the stigma of substance use disorder and try to help to save some lives. Let's go. I'm on a journey to discover the truth. Living life and recovery is lovely. You got the power in you. Surround yourself with positive energy. Judges hitting people with provocative penalties. Need to make a change. Advocate to change the laws. Prove the people that it's not insane. When you stand behind a cause, I'm here to speak about the pain. Recover loud to normalize the disease that's been killing all my friends and my family. The time is now to let it all go and recover loud. The benefit is healthy people. People, family and friends that never have to overdose ever again never have to plead out to a lesser offense I'm proud to say that I recover loud I never thought I could but I'm so proud that I discovered how to live my life again controlling my own destiny I needed recovery I still need it desperately addiction never defined my identity. I recover loud here to tell my own story I recover proud save a life of like 40 I recover loud yeah I recover loud I recover I recover loud, yeah, I recover loud, I recover loud, here to tell my own story, I recover proud, save a life of like 40, I recover loud, yeah, I recover loud, I recover loud, yeah, I recover loud, I recover, 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 I recover loud. started in 2018 I was living in Waterville and um, I was on probation and my PO sick of me failing urine tests and catching new charges and stuff so she's like you need to go to the sober house um, I never knew what a sober house was no idea like anything about really even recovery at that point I just had heard of AA meetings that I had been to in the past and uh, so she told me about a sober house here in Augusta called James Place. And uh, I came out here to James Place, and uh, that's where it all started. Coming to James Place is, was uh, my first experience, like, finding real recovery. Um, so for me, my recovery, there's two parts. And both parts are as equally important as the other. And I need both parts for either one of them to work. Um, for me, it's Jesus and community. Um, I didn't know that that's what I needed until I got here. I first needed the community, which is getting me here in the community. I met people in the sober house that talked about this church that they went to. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not like a Christian. You know, I wasn't religious growing up or anything or really had any kind of relationship with a higher power. And these people told me about this church and they were like, you know, you'll love it. It's really like people there just love you no matter what. Like I'm used to being like, you know, stigmatized and like criticized because of the way I look and like the lifestyle I used to live so I was like really apprehensive about going and um but everybody in the sober house you know these people are all like you know my people and they're going to this church and they're really like feeling it so I was like I'll try it and um I did and it was like the first time I had ever really like listened to somebody when they talked about God because my idea of God was way different I grew up like my dad was Roman Catholic, and it was like fire and brimstone. Like, you know, if you do bad, you're going to go to hell. Like, shh, shh. So you did grow up with religion. Yeah, but not. they didn't go to church. They were just like, shh, you know, like, just tough, you know. So mm -hmm. getting into a church where I actually felt, like, loved for who I was was like, it was an extremely new feeling. I'd never even felt from a human. So for me to understand the concept that, something could love me no matter what I'd done, no matter where I'd been, and like genuinely love me like no matter what it was like, it was truly life changing. So I got that from church and then coming into the recovery community by living in the sober house, I felt that from the people in the recovery community. Like I came here like with like a dog on my tail between my legs, like I didn't know anybody. I was like, oh, it's gonna be, you know, just like come from Waterville. Like it's gonna be just like Waterville. I'm gonna end up getting in trouble and doing all right. this. You know, nobody actually really cares about you. And then coming into the recovery community here in Augusta, feeling like these people actually love me. I came with nothing in my pocket. I remember going to AA meetings and 
meeting people at the meetings and they'd like take my phone number down and they're like calling me right. a couple days later you want to go get some coffee they pick me up buy me a coffee pack of cigarettes and mm. then just drop me off yeah and i'm like that's so weird i'd never had people just be good to me for nothing right it was always because somebody wanted something in return mm. so that's the first time i'd like ever felt it like feel like felt like what it felt like to be loved and Mm. and, and uh, feel like a recovery community. What actually led you to using it? My dad, um, well, I mean, now in hindsight, now that I actually have a couple 24 hours together, I think I was like always an alcoholic and an addict, whether I use the substance or not, mm. um, just the way that like, you know, our mentalities are. I was very selfish, self-centered, thought the world revolved around me. And that's not like an egotistical way, like I thought good of me. Right. I just, it's always me, 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 like, you know, right. poor me, pity me. Um, just always nervous and fearful of the whole world. Growing up, my mom was a really terrible, she still is. I don't have any contact with her. It's a really bad alcoholic. And um, I guess it was just bound to happen. But my dad, the catalyst really was my dad died when I was 12. And um, he was the only type of stability I'd ever had in my life. My mom just was like a complete mess, like was passed out on the kitchen floor for days at a time. And my dad was a workaholic, so he'd get home from real late at work, put us kids to bed, pick my mom up, clean her up, put her to bed. And, and how old were you when all that was going Oh, my whole life growing up, like it's my earliest childhood memories, like four and up, that was like the whole childhood. My grandmother's got like these insane photos of like coming home to like my mom passed out on the floor milk spilled all over the kitchen floor because i'm trying to pour a bowl of cereal at three my sister's a year younger than me I'm trying to make her cereal and i'm like trying to make mac and cheese on the kitchen floor get, like the noodles all out oh, okay. so that was like a normal for me in my childhood that's like so i was used to that and then when my dad died i had no stability and um i just like i was 12 about to be 13 and I was really depressed. My dad had just died and we were getting ready for school one day and I remember my mom just like came in my room and I was like putting my shoes on all like sad and she's like, you know, you don't have to go to school. You can just stay home and drink with me. And I'm like, you know, what 12, 13 year old kids right. gonna say no to that? And I was a skateboard punk rock kid. So I was like, hell yeah. Mm -hmm. So I stayed home, crushed a 30 rack with her. And I mean, I guess that was like the first like experience, like being like, all right, this is what life's supposed to be like. and. Did you go through your whole teenage years kind of that way? Yeah, I mean, it was, it, it started pretty quick and it, I mean, almost immediately I was a full-blown alcoholic. That's not to say that I was dependent on it, but I drank alcoholically immediately. Yeah. I didn't ever drink like, like a normal, like teenage, normal teenager, what normal teenager drinks right, like right. that. But um, I remember just like being, you know, I would say like the first time I actually got drunk and I knew that there was something different about me. I was with my friends and cause I drank beer with my mom and stuff like that, took a couple sips, but me and my friends stole a bottle from Hannaford mm. and um, it was some type of a card with a watermelon Bacardi and we were in my room and we had like grown up watching adults chug. So they were chugging it, chugging it, chugging okay. it. So we did that. We just like swig handed it off. It was four of us in the circle. And we just kept going and going. Yeah. And then the bottle was gone. It was like 10 minutes and the whole thing was gone. So like, we hadn't kicked in yet. I went downstairs to make some ramen and I'm like, it's like it's such a vivid memory. The, when I got downstairs to open the cupboard, the cupboard hit me in the head and my depth perception was off. Yeah. And I knew I was drunk at that moment. My whole body right. got warm mm -hmm. and immediately I felt like just so good. There was nothing wrong. Yeah. My whole life was okay. And I remember like screaming up to the guys upstairs, guys, I'm drunk. And they're like, yeah, so are we idiot. But it's because I'm an alcoholic and I was, destined to be an alcoholic that it meant so it was so different to me they're like yeah, yeah. it's fine we're drunk but to me it was like i finally felt like a normal person yeah i had a similar experience when i was 11 was the first time i had a drink and it was family gathering you know my aunts and uncles um you know they lived at the lake we lived in an apartment complex um i looked up to them mm -hmm. you know and on the weekends they would have you know their friends over in these big parties and you know i always had wanted to be there Mm -hmm. And while I was there, I was allowed to drink. And to me, it was it was taught to me that drinking was taking in as much alcohol as you can till you're throwing up or passing out. You know, and that was what I thought drinking was. So as I got older, um, that's what drinking was. You know, and I was going to the bars in Canada, uh, living in University County, the the borders right there, and the drinking age is 19. Well, a lot of 17 year olds look 19. So 
I was going to the bar six nights a week. And it was from the time I got there till the time they told me that they weren't serving me any more beer. You know, and I'd be woken up off the bar, given the keys, and I was the driver, you know. So, I mean, you know, that modeling that we received, you know, we didn't know any better, you know. Um, and then, in many cases, it's, it's too late, you know, to do something about it. Um, you know, and I ne later on in life, I never had a problem with alcohol unless I had a drink. You know what I mean? Um, so... Um, as long as I don't have that one, I, I can get through. So you mentioned coming into the the sober house. Um, what led you up to that point to, to have you um, going to the sober house? Yeah, so like that, like I said, that was like 15, 16 when I was doing that with my friends. And uh, pretty much my life just revolved around abusing a substance, whether it so started out as alcohol, it's just so easily accessible. And then, right. you know, moved on to pills a lot benzos have a lot to do with my story too um after my dad had died i was diagnosed with like severe ptsd and anxiety like my resting heart rate was like well over 100 beach just sitting there and they put me on like copious amounts of benzos mm -hmm. and which is just a pill form of alcohol and yeah. um i was ingesting so many benzos that i'd black out for like months at a time and it was just like it was terrible um and my life just kind of lived like that i was in in between 15 to literally 20, so it's 27, 28, um, my life consisted of detoxes, uh, rehabs, institutions, jails, most of the time jail. And um, it was just like pure insanity. It got so bad to the point where I pushed away entirely everybody that ever loved me, anybody that ever cared about me just didn't have any more patience with me because they were like, you know, you keep doing the same thing and you keep having these same effects. I mean, throughout all of this, I had a child that, you know, most people are like, oh, you think that would make you change? And nope, nothing changed at all. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't even hardly there for the pregnancy. Um, wasn't I was there for the birth, but I wasn't coherent. And how old were you? Uh, so she's nine now. I was like 23. Yeah. Yeah, I was 23 when, when we had her. And... Um, not so long even, after that, I was yeah. Even at twenty three, you weren't ready to to take that on that responsibility. Oh no, and I didn't even know what responsibility was. The type yeah. of childhood I grew up in, there was no responsibility. My right. mother had no responsibility, so she didn't teach me responsibility. Yeah, I mean, the, my last grade completed in school was seventh grade, and I didn't even really complete it. It was the year that my dad died, so they felt bad and they pushed me on. And no, no child left behind. Same thing in eighth grade, not and then high school. I went for like two days and then just got expelled. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what caused you to be expelled? Getting suspended so much times. I went longer than two days. I just got suspended so many right. times. Kept getting suspended, kept getting suspended. It was like, we're done with you. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, good, I'm done with me too. Yeah. So what did you do after you were expelled from school? Did you just give up on it? Yeah, I s sold drugs and then I drank alcohol, did drugs, smoked crack. My son actually got expelled um, his freshman year. That was mine too. And, um, as a parent of somebody that got expelled, you know, I was I was concerned where his life was going to go after mm -hmm. that, um, you know, and, you know, even though I was high all the time, I knew that I didn't want him to, you know, experience mm -hmm. that, that, uh, you know, feeling of, of unworthiness, you know, mm -hmm. not have, being able to accomplish a goal. Um, so I ended up supporting and, and pushing him to, to continue school. He eventually got his GED. I appreciate it. Um, you know, um, did you go on to get your GED? Yeah. So, yeah. so not, not when I was younger, I had the exact opposite experience. When I got expelled, my mom was like almost like a proud badge of honor. Right. Um, she allowed me to sell crack in the house. I'm not mm -hmm. saying this to talk bad about my mother. I love my mother with my whole heart. Mm -hmm. This is just what really happened in my life. And this is how my life was. Um, I could sell crack in the house as long as I gave her some. Now, do you see your mom as, as being the sick individual? That she is uh, once you realize how sick you were right and, and and you know back then i just thought it was party time mm -hmm. now i just feel so bad that she's you know she still is really sick yeah i pray for her mm -hmm. um, we don't talk we can't talk until right. she gets some help but yeah i just i feel so bad she's had so much trauma she didn't know any better she right. only did to me because that's what her grandfather yeah. did to her and yeah, and you know that's that generational cycle that generational we, we all run into. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we just keep passing it on, passing it on. 
um, you know, until we can find recovery ourselves, find some, some way to treat our problems ourselves. Yeah, right. Um, and then we can teach that yeah. to the next generation. Um, oh yeah, yeah but oh, sorry about the GED thing. So I didn't, I ended up living my whole life without really even needing it. I just would work odds and end jobs, but I got arrested in 2017. This is before my recovery had really started. So I guess you could say that it kind of started here. I was arrested in Somerset County Jail and um, I was just doing like six months or something. And one of the ladies from the adult ed over there, she just liked me. I'd go in the library, pick books and we'd talk. She's like, do you want to get your GED? I'm like, sure. I don't even know what that would take. Right. She's like, well, try these high set tests. And mm -hmm. I did so well on the high set test. She's like, you could just take the GED test right now and I bet you pass it. I'm like, all right, let's do it. So I did it and I did really well at it. She's like, you ever thought of going to college? And I'm like, no. She's like, why don't you apply to college while you're here? So I applied for the welding program at KBCC. Mm -hmm. And um, I got accepted from Somerset County Jail. Wow. It was really cool. Yeah, it was one of the first times that somebody had actually applied and got still accepted while they were still in the county jail. But I ended up getting out, got the money, and I still wasn't ready for recovery yet. Mm -hmm. So I got the money. And then I did do some of the welding program, which was incredible. I do recommend that to a lot of people. Yeah. I liked it, but yeah. I just wasn't ready to. So what are you doing today? Um, so today I, um, I go to school. I'm not full time right now. I only got three credits. I only have three classes left, so I'm taking all of those nine credits. I work full time for the main recovery advocacy project. I'm a Kennebec nice. County community organizer. Um, what's more important though is today I'm a friend. Mm -hmm. um, I'm available for people. Um, I'm a follower of Christ. Uh, I try to devote most of my life to, to being a better person every day because there was so much in my life where I wasn't a good person. Yeah. Um, I'm about to be a father and I'm sober. And I'm so excited about that because it's like something that I feel like I've always wanted and I just never really had the opportunity to do it sober and like clear minded. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a brother. Um, Yeah, in recovery, we get to be all of these things. Yeah, you know, and um, you know, and it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be just one, right? Because you know, we can become all of these things mm -hmm. as long as we keep working to, towards, you know, the goal of, of making ourselves better. Right. Um, you know, and sometimes we don't even realize what we want to be. Right. Um, you know, I know when I went to to rehab, I had no idea who I even was. Uh, I went to rehab at forty two years old. Uh, I started using, um, really when I was 16, I started drinking heavy, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then graduated to other substances later on. Um, but just, that was my go-to, you know, right. a substance. And, you know, when I hurt my back in uh, 2002, I started getting prescribed mm -hmm. medications and that allowed me to go that direction, yeah. you know, and, and at first, um, you know, it wasn't even the addiction to the medication, but the money and the power from selling them all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and at the time, I justified it by saying I'm able to provide my kids the mm -hmm. life that I didn't have, that I wanted as a kid. You know, we were going on family vacations, you know, doing all of this stuff. The kids could do whatever extracurricular activities they wanted. And I didn't have to tell them no. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, me growing up, I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. You know, my grandfather, I was in the band, but my grandfather had to buy my trumpet because my parents couldn't afford it. Yeah. Um, I was on the wrestling team, but I had to get a scholarship and the school provided me with wrestling shoes. Mm -hmm. You know, um, my kids didn't need to do that, yeah. you know, and so that was my justification. And, you know, it, it obviously wasn't the best path to take, um, you know, and today when they look back at you know their childhood, they don't see the good that I tried to do. Yeah. You know, they see everything's tainted because it was drug money. Yeah. 
mm-hmm. or I was high when we did it, mm-hmm. or you know, uh, there's times that they didn't get to do what they wanted because I couldn't get what I needed. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't even tell you how many times we were late to things because I had to wait for my guy to show up before I would leave the house. Oh yeah, um, and if he didn't show up, sorry kids, yeah. um, you know, we're not going. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, today I don't have to do that. Right. You know. I've been noticing, uh, you know, I, I've, I've suddenly got, gotten onto TikTok. Um, if you're interested, you could follow me on TikTok. Um, but what I'm noticing is around the country, the laws out there that, that Maine has, has enacted, um, you know, uh, the ability to carry fentanyl test strips. Mm-hmm. You know, not every state has approved that. So mm-hmm. it, those things are illegal yeah. in some places. You know, so the work that we do here in Maine that has, you know, progressed some of these laws is really important. Um, That's another thing, too, that's like it's been, you know, not necessarily difficult, but it's living because I am totally supportive of all pathways. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that God is for everybody. But for me, my whole life, I was trying to fill a God-sized hole in my heart and in my soul with substances, sex, Mm -hmm. food, anything that made me feel better. Yeah. And that hole could never be filled until I made and found a higher power and made that relationship with them. Yeah. And yeah. that's something I was always trying to consume, trying to fill it with something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, in, in, in recovery, I'm doing the same thing still. Right. Um, you know, uh, work, mm-hmm. um, advocacy, yep. you know, all of this stuff, you know, helping people to to find a better way. Right. You know, that becomes an addiction. In itself, oh, absolutely. You know? um, and it also becomes my program against addiction. Exactly. You know, um, staying connected to all these people, all these groups, all the, you know, people doing the work as well as the people who need the help. Yep. You know, and, um, you know, if we're not in contact or, you know, talking to people who need help, there's not going to be anybody for us to help. Right. You know, um, when we recover loud, we, we put our names out there as somebody that they can come to. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we don't always have to seek out somebody, be, but if we let them know that we're here doing this stuff, mm-hmm. you know, and they realize that they need that, mm-hmm. you know, they're going to know where they can go. Exactly. You know, when I was first, um, you know, still using it in, in University County, there wasn't anybody talking recovery. I know. Uh, there was no recovery center at the time. Yeah. There were no 12 step meetings that I knew of. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it wasn't until after I went to rehab that I found out a guy that I spent you know, almost every day with, uh, he would put me to work, give me cash. He was in a 12-step program, mm-hmm. but hadn't told me about it, mm-hmm. you know. Um, it's attraction rather than promotion. Right, you know, and that wasn't helpful to me. No, I moment. know, I you know. know. So when it, when it came time that I wanted help, I called my aunt, who's a nurse, and she did some research and said, call the hospital, tell, or go to the hospital, tell them you want to detox. Mm-hmm. Well, that hospital isn't set up to detox. No. You know, they put me in a room for five days and mm-hmm. left me alone. Um, but my meth dealer visits me every day. Of course. You know, yep. In the hospital while yep. I'm in detox. Yep. Um, you know, obviously, if I wanted to get high, I could have, but I also could have walked out the door. Right. You know, uh, so I chose, um, you know, even in the face of that, to not mm-hmm. uh, because I really wanted it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as far as I knew, nobody else there had actually done it. Because if I knew them, I was buying or using or selling them something, you know. Um, so to know people who were act- act- actively doing it, I just had no idea. So that's why I got out of rehab. I moved to Lewiston. I cared about my friends back home. And I decided if I recover loud enough, they'll hear me. Mm-hmm. And they'll know recovery is possible. Mm-hmm. You know? So that's, that's how this whole show came about, um, you know, because I didn't want to stay silent. Mm-hmm. and keep my friends wondering, yeah. you know. And I can't tell you the countless friends who are in recovery today, um, you know, that I, I'm grateful that they found a path. You know, they either seen me or someone else doing it, and they reached out and they got it done. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the other hand, there's so many people that have lost, Yeah. you know, yeah. and, you know, that's going to continue to happen. Um, we lost 717 mm-hmm. last year to, yeah. to uh, drug-related overdose. Um and one thing I have to remind myself is that it could be so much higher if we weren't out here doing the work. Oh my gosh, yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, you know, last year, one of, the, 
one of the bills that uh, the Recovery Advocacy Project worked on, um, the uh, expansion of the Good Samaritan sure. Bill. Yep. You know, the day that went into effect, mm -hmm. it had the ability to save lives. Mm -hmm. you know. um, so what is it you're doing this year around the Good Sam Bill? Um, so unfortunately, there was a, a bill put forth that was actually, it's kind of like, trying to target Good Sam and, and trying to change that they will try to, if it, it's not, I mean, can't say it's not, but um, anyway, so bill that a bill that's been put out and they're trying to change Good Sam so that it would, people could still get prosecuted for trafficking, for um, furnishing and um, arresting people with fire, uh, firearms by a prohibited person. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're going pretty hard at that right now. Okay. Now, wouldn't that particular, um, you know, firearms, uh, part of it come under the violent crimes? So, I mean, that part, so sorry, one second. Um, that part is like debatable and also at the same time, is it, is it violent if they're, if they're not hurting anybody with it? You know what I mean? Like, okay. what if they use it for protection? You know what I mean? Like, you know, who's to say that? All we know is that we created the the expand good Sam so that people are covered for any reason. Like you need to be able to call nine one one. We don't want people to hesitate. You know what I mean? We want to make sure people are calling, and you know. So yeah, I got behind that uh, myself. Last yeah, year no, well. I remember I was with you. Yeah, at State House, and yeah. you know, it was just it made so much sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people are not dialing nine one one out of fear. Mm -hmm. Yep, people are dying because mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. When um, you know, having naloxone in a timely manner proves that, you know, an overdose is a preventable right. uh, event, you know. So, um, you know, it's just a shame that uh, anybody would, would attack that particular bill when it's all about saving lives. Right, and that's the reason why it was created, so that lives are saved and people are trying to go and just, like, change it because obviously they're looking for prosecution over, you know, mm -hmm. humanity and like people being alive. Any, you know, we're trying to eliminate any reason for somebody to not call. Do you know what I mean? Right, like, exactly. Like mm -hmm. we want these people to make and sure they call. And we know, we know for a fact that, that that's happening. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You know, even today, without the knowledge of the Good Samaritan Bill, people are afraid to call. Yeah, there uh, is. There's a lot of people that don't trust they don't even, Right, and that's the thing too that's difficult. And this summer, the, uh, the Voices Project's gonna be really vamping up the spreading the awareness and the knowledge about good sam and like yeah. what you know how to use it and how you're protected yeah uh john i just want to thank you for coming on and sharing your story today thank you so much um you know i really appreciate the work you're doing uh, you. with the recovery ethics project thank you. um and uh, i look for, forward to more collaboration absolutely we look forward to having you too we right. love it when you come hey thanks john thank you Hi, I'm Mike Paddleford, and I recover loud. On August 8th, Maine's expanded version of the Good Samaritan Law goes into effect. This law is intended to make it more likely for someone to dial 911 in the case of a drug-related overdose. This law removes the penalties and the threat of prosecution for all drug-related offenses and most non-violent crimes, as well as probation violation and parole revocation. It is now safe for us to dial 911 in the case of an overdose. We don't have to take care of our friends alone. Please help save a life by dialing 911. If you or someone you know would like to carry naloxone, you can reach out to me at recoveryotr18 at gmail.com. Recover loud, everybody. Let's go. I'm on a journey to discover the truth. Living life and recovery is lovely. You got the power in you. Surround yourself with positive energy. Judges hitting people with provocative penalties. Need to make a change. Advocate to change the laws. Prove to people that it's not insane. When you stand behind a cause, I'm here to speak about the pain. Recover loud to normalize the disease that's been killing all my friends and my family. The time is now to let it all go and recover loud. The benefit is healthy people. 
people, family and friends that never have to overdose ever again. Never have to plead out to a lesser offense. I'm proud to say that I recover loud. I never thought I could, but I'm so proud that I discovered how to live my life again. Controlling my own destiny. I needed recovery. I still need it desperately. Addiction never defined my identity. I recovered loud here to tell my own story. 